Hi, I'm I'm Jamie Love. I'm I'm the director of Knowledge Ecology International, and we're going to do a we're going to host a, a short uh, briefing on margin request on a prostate cancer drug marketed in the United States under the brand name of Extandi uh, by a, by a, a Japanese manufacturer, Estellas. With us today, we're going to have uh, four speakers. Uh, we're going to have Robert Sachs, who's uh, uh, living with prostate cancer and was initially had petitioned the Department of Defense to join uh, an ongoing case of the De uh, Department of Defense, which has never been resolved on this case, and subsequently uh, submitted a petition on the 18th of November to uh, Secretary Becerra asking that HHS uh, review the, uh, uh, the, the marching case. Uh, we're going to then listen to uh, Peter Marabuck, who works with Public Citizen, where he directs their Access to Medicine program. Um, following that, we're going to hear from uh, Alex Lawson at Social Security Works. Alex Lawson was one of the main people that led and mobilized a, a, a number of U.S. Uh, citizens to oppose a, reg a proposed regulation by the Trump administration to eliminate the issue of pricing as a grounds for marching requests. After that, uh, we'll finish up with some comments from Eric Sawyer who's uh, another person who's uh, living with prostate cancer and uh, had petitioned Secretary Becerra on, on uh, this week um, to uh, join the join the march in request. Um, just a, a very brief background uh, uh, under US law under the Federal by Dole Act, there's a um, uh, certain obligations on people that receive government grants uh, to provide the government with certain rights in the in the products, as part of the as part of the contract they they, they sign when they when they receive the grant money, one of those rights is the right of the U.S. government to issue a license to third parties to manufacture a generic drug, for example, if they find that there's some abuse of the patent or some other compelling reason for the U.S. government uh, to grant the margin request. Um, the government has an additional royalty free right in the patent they can use worldwide. So they have these two different rights. They have been reluctant to use them in the case of drugs, regardless of what the circumstances are on the issue of the pricing or access of the drugs. The particular statute in mind is uh, that uh, some of these cases um, uh, look at is, a, is an obligation in the definition of what's called practical application, which is an obligation on the, on the patent owners to make products available to the public on reasonable terms. This petition uh, asked the question about whether or not um, uh, Estellas, the company marketing Extandi in the United States, is making Extandi available to the public on reasonable terms when the price in the United States for a drug for prostate cancer is about $156,000 a year, and it's three to five times more expensive than it is in other, any other high-income country. With that, I'd like to turn to Robert Sachs, who's one of the petitioners, and um, um, uh, Robert, I, 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 there's so many things I could say about you because Robert has a very um, diverse background. He's worked for Congress. He's run a trade association. He served on the board of directors of the Dana-Farber. He serves on the board of directors of the Dana-Farber Institute. And I think uh, he's involved in public broadcasting, but he's also very active in um, the cancer patient advocacy. Robert? Uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, uh, but today, I'm speaking because this is personal uh, to me. Um, Extandi is a life-saving drug for many men like myself who are battling advanced prostate cancer, which is to say prostate cancer that has metastasized. Uh, in my case, it, it had spread to my upper spine and my right femur, no longer confined to the pelvic area. Uh, Having to deal with all the ramifications of prostate cancer is difficult enough without having to contend with price gouging by drug companies like Estellas. It adds insult to injury to know that Extandi was developed with taxpayer dollars that I and others contending with prostate cancer have paid. All we're asking in the current petition is for HHS to conduct an administrative hearing on the record 
to determine whether or not the approximate $156,000 annual cost um, for uh, Xtandi that Japanese drug maker Stellis is marketing in the US uh, can be justified in light of the fact that it charges one fifth the price in Japan, one fourth the price in Canada, and a fraction of the price in a number of other wealthy countries. The, Di the uh, 1980 Bayh-Dole Act requires inventions funded by US taxpayers be made available, as Jamie indicated, to the public on reasonable terms. We're simply asking HHS to enforce a law that has been on the books for four decades. Secretary Javier Becerra recognized the availability of marching rights as a remedy when he, as Attorney General of California, led a group of a bipartisan group of attorneys general who petitioned the Trump administration in 2020 to assert marching rights over the drug remdesivir. We're now asking HHS to exercise the administrative authority that Secretary Becerra himself embraced just last year. No new federal legislation is required for HHS to exercise marching rights at this time. Exercise of marching rights in the case of Xtandi would not only help men battling metastatic prostate cancer, but other Americans suffering from serious diseases that require treatment with exorbitantly priced drugs, their taxpayer dollars help develop. Uh, I'll stop there and be happy to take questions later, but I know we have several other speakers. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, our next speaker is Peter Mayerbeck. Peter uh, works for a group called Public Citizen. Public Citizen has been engaged in these issues about the pricing of government funded drugs, beginning with the pricing controversy over the drug AZT for HIV. Uh, Peter has uh, developed one of the uh, more important networks of activists working on issues about drug pricing and affordability. He has a law degree from the University of California at Berkeley. And he's worked for several years on uh, a variety of issues having to do with access to medicine. Peter. Thank you, Jamie. Um, thanks for this forum. So the Biden administration has shepherded two widely lauded achievements uh, this year relevant to today's subject. One is the executive order on competition and the other being Build Back Better. Both, the executive order on competition has, has a number of progressive anti-monopoly policy in various sectors, but left pharma as, as an ellipse, essentially said, we're gonna kick this to HHS to get a report at a later date, filling in what sort of actions the administration can take to challenge the pharmaceutical industry's monopoly power. Uh, when HHS published uh, that report, the, it, it is long on the legislative agenda and actually quite short on the executive power, though it does, as Jamie and Robert have pointed out, indicate the, uh, the interest of the secretary in reviewing marching petitions, something that we hope they'll take quite seriously, particularly with a case as solid as, uh, as Xtandi. Build Back Better, uh, meanwhile, is, is an historic legislative achievement, and we are glad for its modest pharmaceutical benefits particularly the long awaited introduction of uh, negotiation power for Medicare, but they are modest benefits. Uh, in addition to not fundamentally challenging the core issues of patents and monopoly power in which high prices are rooted, they, it, would, it, it wouldn't even address the, the launch prices of medicines when they first come on market. And while some of the benefits will, uh, will take root right away, others will take several, several years to develop. So the pharmaceutical sector is an area where Democrats and President Biden haven't quite delivered on their promises yet, but they have power under existing law to do so. And uh, for years, groups have pointed out to the U.S. government the power it has to address the very serious issue of pharmaceutical companies taking advantage of their patent power uh, to charge unchecked, uh, extremely high prices 
to people living in the United States with severe consequences of, of treatment rationing, depending on which survey you trust, somewhere between one in three and one in six Americans self-ration their own access to treatment because of its exorbitant cost. In Extandi, we have a, a very strong case, a high price, publicly funded drug, tremendous price differential between what people pay in the United States and what people pay abroad. And so we ask uh, if the government is not willing to uh, have a look at this case, at least uh, hold a hearing on this case and uh, potentially authorize generic competition, use its rights here, then, then what is a case where, where the US government would, um, would, would use those rights? Uh, we think a hearing is a very good place to begin sussing these issues out. It would put drug makers on notice that there are limits to its monopoly power and provide a platform to start addressing the root cause of high drug prices, which is, of course, where we, drug companies have patents enabling them to charge these prices. We put very few guardrails uh, on, that, on that system. So with our congratulations to Robert and to Jamie for, for, uh, for prosecuting this case, we hope that the Biden administration uh, will take the power that it has seriously to deliver on the promises it has made. And I'll pass the mic. Uh, thank, thank you, Peter. I, I just want to mention um, one thing that has to do with the, the request for hearing. This is not a request for a congressional hearing that what the petitioners are asking for that both Peter and uh, Robert referred to is that the HHS would hold a hearing on the request. The last time that was done was in 2004 on a request about the excessive pricing of a drug for HIV, ritonavir. In that particular case, in the time period between when the marching request was filed earlier in the year and the hearing was held, um, uh, Abbott, which was the owner of the, um, uh, the, the patents on ritonavir, agreed to roll back the price of ritonavir um, 80% for the people that were on federal programs, which at the time represented about 70% of people living with HIV. So there has been one hearing so far on a marching request, on a pricing request, and none since. Um, and the hearing would, of course, allow the people that oppose the marching request, including the members of the Bayh-Dole uh, Coalition, which are a group of drug companies and research university patent holders, to come in and argue against it. I'd like to next call upon um, um, uh, to speak uh, Alex Lawson. He's the executive director of Social Security Works. He's a, also a convening member of the Strengthening Social Security Coalition, made up of over 340 national state organizations representing over 50 million Americans. He coordinates their education and advocacy operations to protect and improve the economic security of disadvantaged and at-risk populations while maintaining Social Security as a vehicle for social justice. I will also say that the biggest purchaser of Xtandi is the Medicare program, which is part of the social security system. Uh, very glad to have Alex here because Alex also played a, a really instrumental role in pushing back on the proposal of the Trump administration to take pricing off the table on these margin requests. Alex? Thanks so much, Jamie. <clears throat> and thanks to everybody on the call. Um, the idea that $156,000 per year is uh, like, there's a question here. Uh, oh, is that too much or too little, right? We, we actually have to pretend that this obvious thing uh, is not so obvious and give credence to the fact that pharma is like, ah, yeah, well, some people will die because they can't pay it but we still think that is no problem with our price. And the government for years has sort of held up their hands and been like, well, do we have the expertise to determine if that's a reasonable price or not? Uh, and you know, we're saying the whole for years, clearly if people are rationing this and it's harming their health up to and including dying, the price is too high, uh, but Pharma is very profoundly uh, powerful and they corrupt systems with their money uh, to make us battle drug by drug, uh, patent by patent, because each year on each molecule uh, that they can pocket is billions of dollars. Um, so I, am, I know because I'm on a call with people who are much smarter than me and are running this case that the legal 
argument is clear. It's absolutely clear. Uh, and so what we need to focus on is that this is a moral issue, uh, that the government, especially as Peter said, the Biden administration uh, and the Democrats in Congress, are, are their legislative achievement in Build Back Better includes an explicit understanding that high drug prices are a harm uh, to the people in this country and the government has to put forward a remedy to high drug prices. Uh, the Xtandi case is as simple as it gets uh, on this one. And the intent behind the Build Back Better was not to start in the future or limit it uh, to a certain number of drugs. Listen to what President Biden says. He wants to lower people's drug prices now. Outrageously high drug prices uh, need to end. And all we're saying is that that authority exists completely uh, within established law. What HHS needs to just determine, which they can do by looking at it, it on its face, $156,000 per patient per year for Xtandi, uh, when they charge one fifth of that uh, in, the, in Japan where the company is located, that is indefensible. There's nothing they can stand on here. And the harm is, is real. Uh, as Robert spoke to, as Eric will speak to uh, personally. So this is such an obvious issue that the only answer to why it hasn't been done is the corrupting power of the pharmaceutical industry's money. Uh, and they have corrupted the system, uh, the political system, the bureaucracy, wherever they can. They charge monopoly prices, they make tens, hundreds of billions of dollars. They carve off a tiny piece of that and they put it towards politicians to protect their system. Um, but we have millions of Americans now who have been fighting to lower drug prices, even as Jamie uh, points out, to really sort of back of the house, a NIST regulation that pharma was trying to push so that we couldn't even be having this conversation. And we beat them on that. Uh, and we're gonna beat them on this one too. We're gonna never stop fighting because we know that the authority already is there and it's just a choice being made by the government to allow these prices to remain as high as they are. Um, so uh, I want to, uh, I have this quote that I wanna read even though I never do that, but it's, it's a good one and we're on Zoom so it facilitates it. From the final report of the Attorney General to the President on Government Patent Practices and Policies, 1947. It's really straightforward. Inventions financed with public funds should inure to the benefit of the public and should not become a purely private monopoly under which public finance technology may be suppressed, used restrictively, or made the basis of an uh, exaction from the public to serve private interests. Uh, and then it continues. The soundest disposition of government finance technology is as a general rule to open it freely to the public and spread the benefits of the scientific advances as widely as possible. What we're talking about is not radical. It's not new. The perversion that pharma has wrought on the patent system to, to create what we have now uh, is the, the brand new thing. We're just asking a return to a common sense uh, framework where when the taxpayers pay for something, we also benefit from that thing that we finance. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 our next speaker is going to be Eric Sawyer. Before I introduce Eric, I just wanted to mention that uh, the, the, the case that, the that we're talking about today, the Xtani case, we're asking for a very uh, modest rule by the government. The rule that they're proposing is that if a drug is sold in other high-income countries with big economies, uh, that, the, that the price in the U.S. should not be significantly higher than it is in other high-income countries. I mean, you can make a case that it should be lower. Um, and there are, there, there are other cases and other drugs where you'd have to sort of have a different type of a analysis and it may be more complex in this case. But as Alex Lawson said, <clears throat> this one is really simple. Uh, the government has rights in all three patents, which are listed in the FDA Orange Book. 
So there's no question about the fact that whether the government funded each and every patent that's involved in the case. There are generic drugs available. There's a Canadian company that's offered to sell uh, the uh, Exandia in the United States for less than $5,000 a year. Uh, so there are, there are qualified good generic supplies available. There's no regulatory barriers to entry to this particular product. Um, I'm gonna now introduce uh, Eric Sawyer, who's the, the last speaker before we turn to questions. Eric, uh, I got to know Eric uh, when I was working uh, initially on problems with uh, trade pressures on countries in Africa having to do with access to drugs for HIV. And Eric is one of the AIDS actors that really stepped up and, and completely changed the course of US trade policy by organizing uh, mobilization and protest against the US trade policy relating to patents on HIV drugs in Africa. He's been living with HIV for a very long time. And uh, unfortunately for Eric, he's now also living with prostate cancer. Um, uh, he is a, a, a co-founder of ACT UP, uh, which I think is everyone knows what that organization is. And he's also uh, one of the founders of Housing Works in New York, which is a very important organization. And uh, more recently, he's worked for UNAIDS in the, in the United Nations systems. Eric uh, Sawyer, um, glad to have you here. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, thanks so much for letting me uh, take part in today's um, uh, event. Uh, I really don't have a lot of substance to add, uh, which hasn't already been addressed by uh, James, by Robert, by Peter, by Alex. Uh, but I do want to add uh, a personal uh, story, my own, uh, to, to this uh, discussion and also make a couple of comments, both about the U.S. government and uh, drug companies. Uh, it's ironic, Jamie mentioned that the other Martin case, uh, which resulted in a reduction in the price of ritonavir uh, back in the 80s, uh, is also a drug that I was taking at the time. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm now also living with prostate cancer. And so, uh, you know, both of those cases uh, were about me as a patient. Um, and I'm, I'm really outraged that the US government that, you know, in its, its founding documents say that the US government is uh, something uh, for the people, of the people, by the people, but uh, we don't consider that uh, at all when we uh, try to license drugs uh, that are developed on taxpayers' dollars. Uh, there's no consideration of uh, the people in allowing uh, licenses to go forward that allow drug companies uh, to charge uh, the absorbent prices that they charge uh, for drugs that the U.S. Uh, taxpayers pay for. Uh, you know, where is the public good? Uh, where is the public consideration in uh, the licensing practices of HHS, of uh, the Army, of uh, NIH? It's absurd. Uh, the other uh, hypocrisy I want to point to uh, is that of drug companies. Uh, you know, drug companies love to talk about how they care about the people, how they care about your health, about how they're healthcare companies. And they're really not, they don't care about people's health. They only care about making money for their stockholders uh, and for their senior executives. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Exandi is case in point, uh, you know, the fact that the US government paid for the development this, of this drug, uh, it sold uh, for, for five times less in Japan than it sold in the US when the US paid for the drug's development. It's absurd. It's really absurd. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's time that the government uh, take a look at this, have a hearing on this, uh, allow generic production of this drug to come forward so the drugs uh, can be available to patients like myself and like Robert at uh, reasonable prices in the country that paid for their development. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Eric. So now I, we'd like to ask uh, if any of the people that are participating by Zoom wanted to ask any questions. And I guess you can uh, uh, raise your hand in the uh, in the reactions. Uh, and if if there are, if there are any questions, I see I see some 
some people I know on the call, like Brenda Sandberg. Um, 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 some academics I know. Um, uh, I know Peter Sullivan has his hand up. Uh, Peter, uh, go ahead. Peter Sullivan, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm with the Hill newspaper. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, have you talked to anyone in the Biden administration about marching rights? I mean, have you gotten any kind of indication of, of where they are on this? Uh, I'm sorry, could you could you just restate that? I want to make sure I understand it correctly. Uh, uh, have you talked to anyone in the Biden administration about marching rights? Do you, yes. Have you gotten any, any indication from them where they are on this? Yes. Uh, I think the first round of conversations had to do when the Biden administration stepped up, they had to deal with the proposal by the Trump administration to change the regulations so you could not even ask for a margin request if the pricing was the issue. And people were unsure whether the Biden administration would let that regulation go forward or not. We had conversations with a number of people that were working for the government at the time, as did, uh, uh, as did Peter's group at Public Citizen, as did Alex's group. Uh, and there was a lot of comments for the, the result was an executive order by the president on competition that had a special section on this issue where they said that they would block the regulation from going forward and the pricing issues would be considered as a grounds for margin request. Secondly, Secretary Becerra's office put out a report on drug pricing in a report to the president where they said the same thing, that they would consider the price of a product as a grounds for a margin request. This is the first case to come before the Biden administration uh, where pricing is an issue in the first marching case that we're aware of. Um, uh, I, I, I will say that we, we, uh, there was also, at the same time, there was a letter that came from the Hill from some senators, including Elizabeth Warren, Representative Doggett, and other members of Congress, asking the Department of Defense, which was uh, the initial body that the marching request for standing was before, uh, that, that had been submitted by um, by Robert Sachs, uh, my brother, Claire Love, who's a person living with uh, prostate cancer, and a computer scientist, David Reed from MIT, who, who had been on the M faculty at MIT. Um, uh, the, the letter from the members of Congress to uh, the Department of Defense did not mention this case. It was a general, uh, a, a general uh, letter asking that the Department of Defense report to the Congress about what they had done on these cases. Uh, they received earlier this year a really hostile response from the Department of Defense. The petitioners to the Department of Defense case have never had the courtesy of a confirmation that they even have a case pending. There's been, unlike the Department, the Depart HHS, on the other hand, whenever they have a marching request, they always issue a written finding and they do an actual proceeding. We may not like all of the outcomes we've had, but they've always been pretty transparent about what their decisions are and they've provided timely responses. We fully expect the Department of HHS to give a timely response to this, and they're gonna own the decision one way or the other. They're gonna be either saying it's A-OK -okay to charge $156,000 for this drug and a fraction of that everywhere else, or they're gonna say it's not OK. I mean, there's gonna be precedent sent one way or the other. Um, earlier this week, Claire Cassidy was in touch with the Secretary's Office to confirm that they had the, the petition, and we look forward to um, seeing how it's resolved. Got it, thanks. I, I just want to clarify that the, the KI is not a petitioner in this case. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's the, uh, it, it really it's the four patients that are living with uh, uh, prostate cancer. One of them I, I will acknowledge is my brother, however, he, he couldn't be on the call today because he's, he's hospitalized for a different medical problem. But when you're, when you're going through cancer treatment, uh, and every, you know, it's, it's, uh, sometimes it's, it's, um, a lot of things going on. Yeah, I'll okay. add to that, Jamie, um, because in my, in my case, uh, when I went on Extandy, which was, uh, I guess a year ago, September, um, I, I mean, the, the price was, truly shocking and I'm I'm covered by Medicare and I have Blue Cross and so my my copay which I, I can afford but I'm I'm not like a lot of people who are on Medicare and uh, which was about seven hundred dollars a month 
and uh, which for a lot of people that itself is unaffordable. And, and I just read more about Extandi and the generic name is en Enzalutamide and its development. The more I read, the angrier I got about it. And in doing uh, internet search, I came across KEI in the earlier filed petition uh, by Claire Love and, and David Reed. And I, I asked, how can I, how can I help and support this? Um, and, uh, and so, and, you know, and, and coordinated with KEI, but clearly this was something that, um, in, in my case, it came, it came, came from me. You're, you're muted. Uh, I want to add something on the access issue that was raised by both Robert and Alex. And that is that uh, there's two ways that you, you, uh, a high price can affect the access. One is the obvious case that Robert mentioned, which is that you have the, the copay if you have insurance that you have to struggle with. And of course, not all the uh, prostate cancer patients are on Medicare or have insurance. But uh, if you do, uh, the copay can be, can be uh, really difficult, particularly typically at the age people get prostate cancer, they're no longer earning uh, an income. I mean, it's just a, it, it's, it's really a hardship. But the other way it affects it is the decision by the uh, insurers to get give you access to drug at all, because there's more than one treatment for prostate cancer, and you will be pushed toward a drug which is cheaper by a reimbursement authority, um, and you'll have to make a case even if you have insurance to get Xtandi because it's ridiculously more expensive than the alternatives. And what that means is that the decision about the medical care you got is not based on the evidence of the efficacy of the products, but it's based on some cost benefit analysis, which is destroyed by the fact that it's an excessive price. Yeah, I, I, let me add one other thing, which is the fact that um, Medicare um, has covered it, um, it, it isn't, isn't really satisfactory because when Medicare pays out over $2 billion a year for, to Estellas for Xtandi, it's raising the costs of healthcare for everyone. And, and this, this is repeated time and, and again. So it's not good enough to say, well, you know, you're lucky, you know, Medicare covers the bulk of the costs, um, uh, you know, directly, but indirectly, no. I mean, it's, it's costing us more for, for every other drug we take. Can I just, just clarify, you, you have already filed the petition? You filed it earlier this week, is that right? Uh, that would be Eric, uh, I, I think that that's directed to. My, mine, my uh, letter to HHS uh, was sent in, in November, I think November 18th. Uh, Peter, there's a link on our on our webpage. We have uh, uh, like the a press briefing thing, and there's a link. If you click on it, it gives it, it give you a copy of the PDF file of Robert's uh, Robert's letter, uh, uh, Eric Sawyer's letter, and the previous filings were done to DOD. So you'll have access to all the filings there. And and I, I petitioned to join the case uh, this week, uh, and I, I just want to point out too that. You know, prostate cancer is not a rare, uh, seldom occurring disease. Um, uh, you know, a majority of men, uh, if they live long enough, will get uh, prostate cancer. It's a very, very common uh, illness uh, in, in, in men. I, I think it's something like 60% of men uh, have prostate cancer, but, but the longer you live, the higher that percentage uh, goes, and if you live long enough, you uh, uh, you know the number comes to to almost a hundred percent of of men uh, at a really uh, old age are uh, living with prostate cancer. Tim, uh, if I could add just a, a little bit on 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 Peter's question, <clears throat> and I know uh, Peter knows uh, most of this, but this is a long-standing fight that Xtandi is one. Uh, battle in, in things that you see across the system. Uh, the case of Adjahelm right now is, is basically is, is very similar. And what it comes down to is these uh, pharmaceutical corporations, they're slowly but surely uh, just robbing the money out of people uh, because 
when a drug like this gets covered, which we need it to because people need access to it, but when the, there's no break on the price they can charge, uh, you see something like the Medicare Part B premiums going up uh, by huge percentage points that are unaffordable uh, to people on a fixed income. And it's entirely from one drug, Adjahelm, uh, that uh, got uh, approved. And Medicare can't negotiate the price down or use any other uh, means of pushing the price down. And so literally a pharmaceutical co corporation can break Medicare. They can bankrupt Medicare through high prices. Um, so this question is, is an obvious one uh, from the harm, the individual harm that, it, uh, that pharmaceutical corporations cause through high prices. And then uh, that the entire Medicare system can crumple under the greed of the pharmaceutical industry. So the remedy of margin rights on Xtandi is uh, something that the uh, administration has heard from us uh, dozens of times, probably. I'm not sure uh, specifically on Xtandi, but as one of the obvious and legal remedies to high prices that everyone agrees right now, they have to address. Um, Jamie, if I, I might, and, uh... And I'm a lawyer by background, not not a scientific expert, but just for for the other lay people on the call, um, what what Xtandi does is, is it, with um, androgen deprivation therapy, which is what this comes under. You know, we refer to it as hormone therapy, but that's the more technical name for it. I actually take two drugs. One is Lupron, which is an injection. Lupron suppresses your testosterone. So, um, so that, that, that helps on that end. What, what Xtandi does and why it has, has, has been such a good drug is it blocks the receptor on the, the cells that, that will mutate. So you're, you're both stopping the, um, the prostate cancer growth. And then for those microscopic cells, you know, that for that, that which gets through, you're blocking it on the end of other cells that would um, uh, metastasize. And so, and if that happened, and if you don't, if you can't address it both ways, then oftentimes it'll spread and it, it can be very painful through your, through your skeletal system. It's no longer confined to your prostate. Now, not all men that have prostate cancer um, have, have the form of it, depends on their age, that, that is going to metastasize. But you know, for anybody who, who does, this, this drug, I won't say it's a miracle drug, but it's a drug that's been very helpful. And um, I had been on it earlier when I was diagnosed six years ago, another drug called bicalutamide, but bicalutamide wasn't as effective as enzalutamide. And um, so uh, it is the, the best drug today for men uh, with advanced prostate cancer. Uh, if, if I can just add a, a, on the efficacy, uh, this year there was a number of cancer drugs that were before the WHO to include in their essential drugs list. Many of the products which are really effective, such as Keytruda, were rejected from the list this year because of their high price. The one of the few high price drugs that made it on the list was Azul. Uh, and and um, I always have trouble with the generic name here, Robert. Uh, but, uh, right, um, uh, of Xandi. So uh, the WHO has put this drug on the honest essential drugs list. And, and, and that I think is a, an a important signal as to uh, how important the therapy can be. Another thing that comes up with really expensive drugs is. I believe the efficacy of this drug is better if it's taken early on after your diagnosis, not used as a salvage therapy. But what happens when you have a high, high price on a drug, and I know Eric has seen this with HIV drugs, you often can't get the best drug you need until you can uh, try out some other drugs. And that puts the patient at risk because uh, for some cancer patients, that's a really uh, uh, 
that's really a road you don't want to go down because if, 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 for, if you've ever been around or yourself been diagnosed with cancer, one thing you don't want to do is sort of roll the dice and take excessive chances on your treatment. I mean, you're really kind of risk averse. And, and high prices mean that sometimes effective drugs are not available until you've tried and failed in other therapies. I think that's all of our questions. I would like though to give the, the, the speakers one more opportunity to give a closing comment before we conclude this. And, and this will be recorded. It's gonna be up on, uh, on YouTube so people can look at it later. I'd like to uh, maybe start in, in uh, reverse order of how we started. I'd like to start with Eric and then go to Alex, followed by Peter Maverick, and then, um, and then Robert Sachs. Eric? Uh, yeah, the one thing that I would like to add is that, um, you know, we need more people to put pressure on the U.S. government uh, around access to essential medicines at an affordable price. Um, you know, we AIDS activists uh, had a sense of urgency. There was no uh, interest in trying to research treatments for HIV because uh, the people who were dying were junkies, queers, and whores, and nobody cared. And so we took it upon ourselves to raise our voices uh, and take to the streets, put our lives on the line to try to change that scenario. Um, it's time that, you know, the general public uh, step up also and and say, you know, look, everybody has a human right to health. And, you know, for us to allow the U.S. government uh, to be a, a bad steward of uh, tax dollars and, you know, dole out money for uh, the development of essential medicines or, or vaccines in the case of COVID, uh, you know, that's a current uh, issue, uh, and then not care about whether or not the U.S. Uh, people get access to those medicines at an affordable price. Thank God that because COVID is so transmissible, uh, it's being provided to the U.S. Uh, population uh, for free. But, um, you know, we have to, as citizens, care about how our country uh, is using our tax dollars and whether or not our country is really uh, providing access uh, to uh, the human right to health. Uh, so um, I hope everyone takes that message to heart and lets their Congress members and senators know uh, that you care uh, about how your tax uh, investments for drug research um, are spent and whether or not those drugs that are developed are affordable to, to uh, U.S. citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Alex Lawson. Alex, you're muted. I'm on mute. The tagline <laughs> of the year. You're on mute. Um, I, I always do that. I think where we are in the current fight is entirely informed uh, by uh, Eric's work previously uh, and what ACT UP did, what AIDS activists did. Uh, what I learned when I was a health educator in an HIV clinic uh, is that there's never a time we can't, we, we can stop pushing. Uh, because the pharmaceutical corporations are pushing on the other side all the time, all the time, because they only have one way of making money, which is to restrict access uh, through high uh, monopoly prices. That's how that's what they do. That's how they make money. And on the other side are people who understand like this is a molecule that can change or save a person's life. Uh, it exists the government is making a choice that allows a business to decide who's worth getting this molecule. Uh, and it becomes even more ridiculous when the taxpayers pay to develop the molecule in the first place, as in the case of Extandi. And then we hand the molecule to a company that turns around and charges us the highest drug price in the world. And then we throw our hands up and are like, well, what can we do about it? Uh, as the government. And that time is over. That time is over. Even though Build Back Better is not across the finish line, across the board, people have uh, had made statements and made it clear that the government has an affirmative duty to address high drug prices and an understanding of what is a reasonable price. 
Uh, and we have a lot of work to do. The system has been corrupted by pharmaceutical dollars for a long time, uh, but drug prices are so outrageously high right now that this isn't a partisan issue. This is across the board. People hate pharma because pharma is gouging everybody. Um, the Extandi case is a tip of the spear. It is a perfect uh, example of how ridiculous the system is. We developed it, we paid for it. Then they charge us $156,000 a year, five times more than the country where the corporation is located. It's just uh, stealing from us. And the government has a duty to act on this. Uh, and we know though, that the government won't do that without enormous pressure uh, from the outside. And this is what we will be doing. We will be rolling all of the energy uh, that right after we get Build Back Better across the finish line to actually implementing it uh, in and outside legislation, including the use of executive authority to deliver on the promise of lower drug prices for everybody. Uh, and Extandi is just the most obvious case of this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Peter Merberg from Public Citizen. Yeah, the lights pointing right in my face, so I'll spare you guys that, that blinding and just go off video. But, um, you know, so just to say, the pharma box is not checked. We're going to need all of us to build on Build Back Better. It's a significant achievement, but it doesn't get at the root cause of uh, monopoly pricing. And this is sort of both a very good and a modest case, what we're asking for when there's such an exorbitantly priced drug, much higher priced in the United States than in uh, than in other countries and publicly funded. And a hearing is a good opportunity for the US government to begin sussing these issues, um, to suss these issues out. Uh, the, we, Democrats have not yet, the failure to address that root cause has to do with what Alex says, pharma's power uh, in politics, including in the Democratic Party and Democrats like Cinema, Scott Peters, and Kathleen Rice, who have watered down achievements um, so far. And we hope that next year, we all sort of shake that dust off and uh, get back to dealing very seriously with the problems of, of medicine pricing that, um, that affect patients everywhere in this country. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Robert Sachs. Uh, thank, thanks, Jamie. Um, build Back Better, is a good start, but I, I just want to make clear, it's not mutually exclusive with the administration using its executive authority for which was authorized in this case by Congress um, to address exorbitant drug prices on a much uh, faster timetable. And the Extandi case offers that opportunity. Um, even if, if Build Back Better it becomes law, it's upheld in the courts, um, initially it, 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 it deals with the 10 most expensive drugs and Extendi is far from the top of that list. So what, what this does is say, this, this could happen tomorrow. And we're not asking HHS to rule on it tomorrow, we're saying grant a hearing. If Estellas has a case to be made, let them um, put forward evidence, let there be discovery, um, let there be depositions taken. Um, uh, we're happy to have this adjudicated on the merits, on the facts of it, and then you know, let the chips fall where they may. And if that sends a signal to other pharmaceutical companies, all, all the better. We're not asking for, for micromanagement of drug prices. We are asking that for those of us who are dealing with cancer and other very serious diseases, that we shouldn't, in addition to, to dealing with the disease, we shouldn't have to be, you know, spend our time worrying about whether it's going to bankrupt our families to get us the treatment we need. So um, this is an opportunity and, you know, there's, you know, hasn't been a, a president, I mean, more 
more committed on the cancer front than, than President Biden. And um, so this is a natural for his administration. And it's not just uh, Secretary Becerra who has embraced marching rights. Um, Vice President Harris did as a, a senator. Uh, uh, Secretary Buttigieg did when he, he was running. Um, others who are not part of the administration last campaign, Senator Warren, uh, Senator Sanders. I mean, recognize that marching rights are something that the government has and can exercise. And we're saying the time has come for that exercise. Thank you, uh, Jamie and my fellow participants uh, uh, for being here this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. That was a great, that was a great statement uh, to help wrap things up. I just want to offer a couple of quick comments, and then I'm going to uh, end the end the uh, end the video recording. Um, first, uh, uh, as as Robert uh, uh, said, and others have said, uh, this uh, Alex has said, uh, this requires no legislation. It requires uh, no regulations. You just have to basically enforce the law that's been in the books for a long time. The last time a president had a hearing that resulted in the rollback of a price on a government-funded drug was the 2004 Ritonover case done under President Bush, a Republican. So it's something that can be done uh, and they can get it right this time and go, for, uh, in my opinion, they should go for, further than they did in 2004, which is limited the benefit to people on government uh, funded programs. The last thing I want to mention is a conversation I had with a journalist from the New York Times when one of uh, an earlier time when they, uh, uh, the first uh, marching case was filed under a different president for Xtandi. And I started to talk to him about it. He said, well, we're not going to write about it. Uh, he said, because you're not going to win. And I said, uh, well, wait a second. I, I haven't even told you what, what our case is. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't, he said, well, it doesn't make any difference. You're just, you're just never going to win a case. And I said, well, you're saying that the facts don't matter. And he said, yeah, the facts don't matter. And I said, well, if the facts don't matter, isn't that the story? And I think that's here. You've got something in the books. The Vital Act was passed with the promise that these safeguards would protect the public from abuses of patent rights. We're, we're, we're at, uh, at 2021 right now for a, 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 you know, an act that was passed in 1980. It's really time to, uh, uh, that the act is enforced, uh, uh, not just the provisions that are favorable to the patent owners, but the provisions that they're designed to protect the public. I'd like to thank everyone for joining the call today. I know there's a lot of competition for these events. Uh, we hope to make this uh, available to a wider audience by putting it on YouTube. And I'd like to thank Claire, who's done all the uh, organizing and work and has also uh, uh, helped manage the, uh, uh, the event today. And with that, um, I'm just going to end the call for everyone. Um, 